You turned out Harper for swimming? Dude, whenever I tell anyone about that story, they think I'm crazy. I, even the day before, like, I had a panic attack and an anxiety and, like, I couldn't really breathe or, like, I just felt like literally the world, I'm carrying the world on my shoulders. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to a new episode of Updol, a podcast series from the National News dedicated to Arab athletes and their respective journeys towards the Paris 2024 Olympics. I'm your host, Rima Bullil, and today I am joined by the most successful swimmer in Egyptian history, a two-time world championship medalist and holder of multiple African records, Farida Osman. Farida exploded onto the scene as a 16-year-old when she became Egypt's first junior world swimming champion back in 2011. She has since become one of the best sprinters in the world, shattered numerous records, and participated in three Olympic Games. Farida has made the final in the 50-meter butterfly in six consecutive world championships. And during her collegiate career in the U.S., she swam times barely anyone has ever clocked. Ahead of her fourth appearance at the Games, I speak to Farida about what it's like being the face of Egyptian swimming for so long, the obstacles she had to overcome, her heartbreaking Tokyo Olympics, the brutal backlash that followed, and how she rebounded from that disappointment to get back in contender form. Expectations on Farida are huge every time a major swimming competition comes around, and Paris will be no different. How does she handle it all? Join us on this new episode of Abtol to find out. Farida Osman, it is a true honor to have you with me on the podcast, and I'm so, so happy we managed to make this work, especially how busy you are. So thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. (laughs) Me too. Farida, when I was preparing for this uh, podcast, I realized, I was looking back at everything I've written about you, which I write a lot about you. Uh, and I realized that the first time I met you was 12 years ago, in 20, almost exactly 12 years ago, because That's it was crazy. December 2011. You had won the gold at the World Junior Championships just a few months earlier in Peru. Yeah, I remember yeah. at the time, yeah, I had written about <laughs> it and, and I was like, oh my God, there's an Egyptian girl who's barely 16 and she won gold at the World Championships and you set a meet record and all that. And then I got the opportunity to go to Doha for the Arab Games and Arab Games is like a mini Olympics of all these different sports to yeah. people who don't know. For swimming was one of so many sports, but uh, I was lucky enough to go. And you were 16 and you won seven gold medals against grown-ups, mind you, this is not juniors. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, you were uh, the, you had the most medals of all athletes of all the sports there. Uh, And I'm just wondering when you look back at that 16 year old, what what were your ambitions at the time? What were, what what was in your mind? 12 years ago, it was literally, I think, my junior year going into my senior year of high school. And then I decided, like, I wanted to go to the U.S. for college. So this is when I remember just, like, the recruiting process. Like, which college do I want to go to? I need to research here, talk to this coach, and, like, look at the programs. And, you know, I'm a sprinter. I swim the 50 meter and the 100 meters. So I think, like, in that time, it was just stressful for me, but also my family, because, like, we're honestly very close and like we do everything together so anything I go through they go through obviously that has ups and downs but I think like that time was a very stressful period because I knew that I want to go to the U.S. but I just didn't know where or like not even where to begin I think like I was one of the first ones like the first Egyptian to go through that recruiting process to go to the university in the U.S. So I was like, oh, my God, I need to start doing pros and cons. Like, what am I looking for in a, you know, U.S. college? Like, I want to be good in swimming, but also academics is very important to me, too. So, like, just, like, researching and, like, that dream of, like, going to the US, to the U.S. to train but also study was definitely something I was thinking about during that time. And, like I said, like, as a family, we all went through it. Like, we all went through the recruiting process and... I decided to choose Cal because it was very strong in swimming, but also very strong in academics. And my brother went to Cal too. So we were familiar with the campus. Like we know what to expect. And like the coach, Terry McKeever and like the swim team, like they're very good in the sprint program and I'm a sprinter. So I just felt like this was the perfect fit for me to go. And 
you had to t you turned down some really flashy schools to go to yeah. Cal, which is a great school. I know Berkeley is amazing, but I, not many people can say no to Harvard. But you did, I right? know, <laughs> I know, I did. Whenever I tell anyone about that story, they think I'm crazy. Like even other family members, like my uncle and my grandmother, like you turned out Harvard for swimming, and I'm like, that's the thing. Like I really want to like choose a school that was really good in swimming but also good in academics and I felt like if I went to Harvard it would have been literally just school swimming would take a back burner I would not improve like I just felt like my life would be more as a student which is great for some people but I think for me I just wanted to do both they're both equally important to me and so much credit for you and your family to be not know much about the process and everything and, and make that call. I think that was awesome. One thing, I have a funny story, uh, speaking of your family. In, um, <laughs> when I saw you in Doha, they were handing out a, a, a bonus prize to the, to the two athletes, the, 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 the male and the female athlete with the most medals. Yeah. And it was you and I think Osama al Meluli, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. at yes. the time. And they wanted to give you $35,000. Uh, as a paycheck, as like a bonus. Yeah. And I remember when I saw you, I was like, you're, you're, I mean, you're a 16 year old who just made $35,000. And at the time you mm. weren't really thinking, you were like, yeah, I'm going to buy some shoes and whatever. It was funny. <laughs> but then you My didn't mom. accept it. You didn't accept I that know. money, but yeah. I didn't know. And your mom called me freaking out. <laughs> she's, a sweet, <laughs> she's a sweetheart. Like I really felt that day. It's so... Um, it's just so nice when you have the support of the whole family that way. Yeah. And so your mom called me and she's like, we didn't take the paycheck. And the yeah. reason is you have to maintain your really eligibility. Will. I think yeah. a lot of people don't understand that if you're going as an athlete to the States to study and compete for a certain university, you're not supposed to be making money. I know in just the last couple of years, things have changed yeah. and yeah. deals and things like that. Yeah. But your chance to make money from your sport goes away for the entire period that you're exactly. swimming for college because you have to be an amateur, which um, also like there's so many of these details that I'm sure at the time you probably didn't, you know, you weren't no, even thinking. We didn't, <laughs> no, we didn't even like know a lot of the things like we literally just learned as we went. And then like with the NCAA rules, like they're very strict about pri like prize money and like you can't really accept money from anything. So that's why we declined the money. And then, like, now, a few years later, people can make money even though they're in college. I'm like, oh, of course, not my time, but now it you, is you okay. You paved the way. You paved the way. I, yeah. I tell every every athlete who went to college, I tell them, at least you were part of the change somehow. Yeah, the change, for sure. <laughs> no, awesome. we were, like, very nervous about, like, if we we're missing any details. Like, let's see, my mom would read and read and research and, like, just to make sure we're, like, okay to go because like i really wanted to go and didn't want to do anything to like jeopardize it mm -hmm. so <laughs> you go to cal and your brother wasn't there anymore when you went mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. so i i remember that was not very easy for you at the beginning can you tell me mm -hmm. a little bit why was it challenging yeah. at the beginning and and what so, got you through it yeah so i think like so my brother had graduated and moved to New York. So he wasn't in California anymore because he was working in Morgan Stanley in New York. And then this is when I came in as a freshman. It was 2013. And I think like there's this stigma around like fall training. Like in the fall training, usually like it's the hardest. Like some people don't even make it through fall training. And I'm like, you know what? It's fine. Like, I like I'm I'm good like I'm gonna be fine so I literally go into like freshman year like obviously everyone on the team is so fast and it's very competitive like if you're not on top of your stuff like there's others who's gonna like replace you and take over you know it's fine so like I go into like freshman year my fall training and I wouldn't keep up with their practices because keep in mind like before then like I was training alone in Gazira club like this is just me and my coach like everything was tailored to me like even the intervals and the sets and everything was just for me so I didn't really have to go through like you know pushing myself and trying to make the interval time because everything was tailored to me and then I never really raced people in practice because again I'm alone <laughs> you know in practice so like it was like a lot of new things so like a new place a new coach like a new environment like just like of course as a freshman you struggle because like going from being at home with your family and pretty much everyone's helping you to do things so like being on your own 
And obviously school in Berkeley is not easy at all. So like balancing both was obviously really hard too. So I think like definitely fall of my freshman year is like, I would honestly say was one of the hardest time of my life. Like I remember like I would call my brother in New York and cry to him and telling him like, I don't think I'm gonna, I'm gonna be able to like continue and like this is so hard like I've never trained this hard and like my coach was like yelling at me back then Terry was like I love her like she was like really pushing me and like she was such a tough coach but I think that helped me like become a better swimmer and obviously a better person because like she's been pushing my limits like she taught me how to be comfortable with the uncomfortable you know and I feel like as a freshman and like suddenly being alone and doing everything on your own and then going through this it was definitely really hard so I would say like first semester of my freshman year was very hard but I think like once I adjusted and like obviously everyone takes a few months to adjust once I did like I'm also the type of person like I would like my racing and competition doesn't necessarily correlate to how I train. So, you know, there are like people who are racers and people who are trainers. And I would say I'm definitely a racer. And I think like this is when Terry like had to learn that I'm actually doing my best in practice. It's just like in my racing, like my competition, I become a different person, <laughs> you know? So like this is like when I first, like, it was my freshman year, NCAAs, like, this is when I performed really well, and, like, I was, I think, the first Egyptian to final in the NCAA, and I think, like, Terry was like, oh, my God, you're actually really good. I'm like, I know, I just have been struggling in practice, but I'm doing my best, I swear. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah just, amazing. like, since then, like, everything has become, you know, just, like, smooth sailing. <laughs> so something clicks when you when when it's a, a race and i think and that that explains a lot that's why you're a champion yeah because like for sure and you had an amazing <coughs> college career like that i i don't have all the stats on me right now but i know that you won your first like yes. ncaa title in 2017 at some point i think you swam like the yeah. second fastest time in history in one of yeah. the races and things like that so it, considering how you started and, and how it ended up going i think that's amazing what would you consider to be the highlight for you of your college career um, I think the highlight of my college career is definitely the people that I met, like people on my team. Like, you know what they always say, like in 10 years, you're not going to remember your times. You're not going to remember if you final. You're not going to remember your medals. Like, it's just you remember the memories that you've made along the way. And I honestly feel like I've gained a lot of like really good friendships. Like, even um, my college roommate, I've lived for, with her for four years, but, like, we're still best friends up to, until now. We talk, and, like, I see her every once in a while. She's from Spain. Um, like, I would say definitely the people and the fact that I was able to improve my swimming, but also, like, having a very good education as well is definitely a bonus, you know? Um, so, yeah, I would say that would be the highlight for me. <laughs> So I remember um, there's this remarkable stat uh, that's out there this year is that you made the final in the 50 meter butterfly at the world championships, the long course one, which is mm -hmm. the bigger deal, six consecutive times. And you, your first final was 2013 and you were only 18 years old and you were the first Arab female to make a final at a world championship. So you did it in 2013. 15, 17, 19, 21, 23. Uh, and 20, and oh yeah, 21 has become yeah, 22. Yeah, 22 so. basically. Uh, yeah, 21 uh, became 22 because of yeah. COVID. And also, just so people who don't understand what a final means, you have to go through heats, which has so many swimmers, especially in the sprint races. There's like mm -hmm. so many swimmers split into so heats. Many. And then you have to be top 16 to make it to semifinals. And then you have to make it in the top eight to make it to the final. You've done that every single world championship since yeah. 2013 till today, which is uh, hello. But also um, you won two bronze medals in mm -hmm. 17 and 19. Yeah. Uh, Sharing a podium with just absolute legends. I love that. Po like it, it was an actually identical podium for both. Yes, with, yes, uh, that's true. Sarah and yeah, Ranobi. Ranobi, yeah. Yeah, which I love because it was like two years apart and it's the same <laughs> thing. Uh, yeah. I'm sure you would have wanted it to be a higher step on the podium. It's still remarkable. Yes. Uh, 
so I know you know all that, but I want people to know everything yeah. I just said. <laughs> um, what does it take to be this consistent from being an 18 year old going to a world championship to 10 years later, still maintaining your place among the top eight, top seven, actually? T tell me about that. Yeah, so I think like people underestimate the amount of effort, like and like honestly, dedication, commitment, just like hard work. Like it honestly takes so much. Like some people believe that if you've done it once, then no, you can do it again, no problem, you know. But like I think like after that 2017 medal, like I've really received a lot of like welcome and support and like you know acknowledgement and everything and like this is where pretty much my career took the next level you know but I think like that also put a lot of like expectation and pressure on myself like even everyone just expected me to perform all the time and I remember like going into 2019 like mentally I was like very nervous like I even the day before like I had a panic attack and an anxiety and like I couldn't really breathe or like I just felt like literally the world I'm carrying the world on my shoulders you know and it was not a nice feeling and the fact that I could still do it again like in 2019 was honestly something I'm really proud of because it takes twice as much work to achieve the same level as like the one before like I think people underestimate like how much hard work and effort like that goes into this just to like even stay the same like even like if I get sick for like a week I would take like maybe two weeks to come back to where I was like that's the thing with swimming like it's really hard because even if you miss one one or two days you like you go you go back five days <laughs> you know like that's the hardest thing about swimming but I think like Honestly, I am proud, like looking back at, at all these finals, I'm proud of how I was able to show up no matter the circumstances around, like whether it was like pressure, expectation, like what I'm going through in my personal life is just like that consistency really shows, um, I guess that like you would say like the depth of my hard work and like how I was really able to like give it my all each time and I think like I'm proud to say I was able to do that obviously I wanted to medal more and I always want to like like meet people's expectations <laughs> but at the same time like I know I've did I've done my best I gave it my all so whatever happens happens and I think like that's has been my mentality going into any big competition coming up So I want to touch on that because you became the, the face of Egyptian swimming. And I, I don't know if that's something you would seek or not, if it's a role that you thrive in or not. I want to know, first of all, when did you realize that you've become that? Um, and then I want to know what kind of pressure that comes with. <laughs> yeah, so like I said, like 2017 was definitely the first one that I could really feel the pressure and expect like obviously going in and meddling is great because you had no expectation you like you don't really know what's gonna happen obviously you have a goal and you want to achieve that goal but like if it came it came if it didn't no one would even know you know <laughs> but the fact that I had to repeat it again in 2019 this is when I really felt the pressure and expectation like like I said like the night before I did not sleep I had anxiety. I remember just like consider like I don't know if you remember but I scratched the 50 free in the morning before the 50 fly because I was not doing well. You know? And I feel like it was just really hard cuz at the same time I didn't want to disappoint anyone. I know a lot of people around me worked really hard for this to happen and at the same time like I wanted this for myself too. I wanted to be the only Egyptian who's ever medaled not only once but twice in world championships. So I think like 2019 after going through the anxiety and like feeling the pressure and like living pretty much like a panic attack and then having to perform is when I realized, like, I need to do something with my mental health. And, like, this is when I started working with a sports psychologist because I realized, like, the expectation, the pressure is just a lot. Like, a lot of people don't realize how much weight it carries on you. Like, 
and being able to perform through that just takes so much mental strength. And I think like going through that with my sports psychologist after we had like a base to like, okay, this is what I do when I'm stressed or like when I'm under pressure and nervous, what can we do to like overcome that and perform? You know, and I think like mental health when it comes to sport, swimming or even sports in general, like plays a big role in like an athlete's performance because there are so many things going on in your life, like whether it's your personal life, your work life, just your family, just like anything could like really affect how you perform. And the, the sad thing about swimming is like if something tiny affects you, like your race is gone, especially that I'm a sprinter. I only have 25 seconds to 50 seconds max to like really perform my best and like be the best version I can be in that race. So like learning to deal with the pressure, learning how to, you know, rationalize like people's expectations. At the end of the day, they were really part of my journey. Like the thing is, I always told myself like I would accept any criticism or feedback from my inner circle or like my support system because they've been through what I've been through and like they know what it takes. They know what I've been dealing with. Anyone outside doesn't know what has been going on. So I can't really get upset about that, you know, like, but if my mom told me something, my coach, like my brother, you know, like anyone who was actually there and has seen everything I've been through and has something to say, I will openly listen. So uh, I want to talk Olympics because I think also for a long time, people didn't realize because your signature race is the 50 fly. Mm-hmm. And that is not an Olympic distance. And while you're very good in the 50 free and 100 free and 100 fly and you work on that, it's it's also different. Like you, everyone has a signature race. You're yeah. not the only person who has a signature <laughs> race. Like that's okay. It's a thing. So for so long, people didn't realize when you were doing so well at Worlds in the 50 fly, they're like, oh, we're getting a medal from Farida in the Olympics. Yes. But that race doesn't even exist in the yeah. Olympics, which is a bummer. Um, but you... You are trying to go to the, your fourth Olympics, which is yes. already also remarkable. So I remember 2012, because I spoke to you before that, and it was such it was a last minute thing. You didn't know you were yeah. going. They were kind yeah. of filling filling the the kind of the filling spots. The and, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then they were like, "Oh, okay, Farida, you were gonna make it. Yeah. You were in the states with your parents, like on holiday, yes. and suddenly uh, yes. make it to London." Now I remember that very well. I um, know. So I can imagine that that first one was just literally you like dipping your toes and in, in, in the whole thing. Mm. And, and that was new. But if you look at the um, we're going to talk about Tokyo separately, but, yeah. like, <laughs> but like with with, uh, with London and Rio uh, 2012 and 2016, what were some of the standout moments, whether related to the pool or away from the pool, like in the village, anything? What are some of yeah. your standout memories from those first two Olympics? So London, obviously, like you said, I was not that prepared. Like I was in New York visiting my brother and like literally about to like take a break from swimming because I was not chosen to go. So I was like, you know what? I have a break. I have a like free summer for the first time in like a few years. So might as well just go and enjoy. And then literally when we're there, like two weeks in, I haven't swam in two weeks. <laughs> and then like we get a call saying like you need to come back to Egypt because you're going to the <laughs> like obviously I will not decline this spot like I wanted to go so badly like even for the first time just to go for the experience and like just to watch people around like how they race how they eat how they sleep just like being in that Olympic village I think like obviously going without any expectations to like perform or anything just to like represent Egypt like was such an honor for me and I think like I took that opportunity to try to learn as much as I can in that experience And then going into Rio, having that London experience just helped me understand what I'm going into. Like, I know what to expect. And I think, like, usually the first one, like, first Olympics is definitely takes you back. Like, it's just, you know, there's so many new things going on around you, not really aware aware of. So I was glad that I was able to do that in London. And so that didn't take away from Rio. And I think Rio was, like, my best performance swimming wise and I was a junior in college and I semi-finals in the 100 fly and I think I think I went best times in the 53 and the 100 fly see like after a few years you forget 
<laughs> you forget all the time. But I'll I think check. like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think like uh, like Rio was like a really good experience because in the technical like swimming side, I was proud of how I showed up. I was still young. I think I was twenty one, um, and like going through, you know, like prelim semifinals and like just like that morning and afternoon swim, just like you also get to learn so much about yourself. And I was in college and like having that few years of training from college really showed up in Rio. So I was really happy with my performance there. Obviously I wanted to final, but you know, there's like step by step, you can't just go from zero to hundred. And I think like go like after my Rio performance, I was very confident to go into Tokyo, <laughs> you know, the Tokyo Olympics. And that's like a different story. <laughs> that is. But uh, for me, uh, the Tokyo story uh, is very important for several reasons. The I would like you to explain the pre, the build up to it, which included COVID and, mm-hmm. and, and the yeah. postponement and changing location. But also, which I also co- like was very closely following you after Tokyo, it was remarkable for to see how you rebounded from that. So people, I don't think everyone understands what it means to have a disappointment. And then still a few months later, I see you in Abu Dhabi killing it (laughs) in the world championship. So let's let's talk pre-Tokyo. I I would love it if you can try and, I know you told me this story before, I want the world to hear it from you. (laughs) Just like, uh, first of all, when you graduate, uh, I from college. I think you have a, another year of eligibility or something, and then you need to um, figure out what to do. How does it work? No, back then it was only four years of eligibility. So once you were done, you're like pretty much a professional swimmer now. So you just either stay or go somewhere else to train. It was really up to you. Um, okay. so but I you think, do? yeah, I think for me after I stayed an extra year at Cal to train as a professional. And then after that, I realized, like, I just want to change. And I think my body wanted to change. You know, like, it get, swimming is pretty much a very boring sport, to be honest. So, like, doing everything repetitively when you already know what's coming is predictable. I just felt like I needed change. And this is when I realized, like, I want to try out a different coach. And this is when I went to Virginia Tech to swim um, with Sergio and I've stayed there from 2019 until COVID, you know, <laughs> and I think like I was training there. I think like I was really excited about the new training, but I realized like I'm the type of swimmer who needs to recharge and be happy outside of swimming so I can perform. Like I need to be social. I need to do some fun things. I can't just have swimming Swimming, 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 you know, like everything mentally, I just need something different to like, you know, check out a little bit. And I think Virginia, Virginia did not give me that. And I think this is where I realized I was really struggling. And at the same time, COVID hit, COVID hit Feb, March 2020. And we were all training to like prepare for the Olympics. Like, I think this is the best physically and mentally during that time my best or like that's the best I've ever been like I was really proud and like happy with my progress so far going into Tokyo 2020 and I think COVID and then COVID hit and then everything just (laughs) went south like Olympics was cancelled I have I had to like go back home like remember like we couldn't really find flights anywhere so like we would all have to, I was coming from the US, so we all had to like fly into DC because that was the only flight available. And then like I went home and then I stayed home from April to September. That's like what, six months, like five months. And I think then we couldn't really train because it was COVID. So like obviously my per- my performance and my f- fitness is going to go down. You know, it's just, like out of my control. But I did my best to like stay in shape and like, did different things to like keep myself busy and in shape but again it's not the same as training in like a system like a routine fixed schedule kind of thing anyway like september comes i moved back to the us to virginia to train um for the tokyo 2021 olympics and i think like you know how like our bodies are like a machine 
you know, you could try to prepare every bit of it. So when the time comes, you perform your best. So like you take care of your nutrition, your sleep, your recovery, like even your training and your mental aspect of it. So like my my machine was ready to go in Tokyo 2020. So with the postponement that added another year of this, you know, intense environment. And I think like with COVID, it was really hard because we couldn't do much. Like we literally just had to be there at a certain time and leave because like we can't really overlap with other people. And it was just like a lot of changes and a lot of unknown. And this is when I realized like, mentally I don't think I (laughs) I'm doing great like no matter what I did no matter what I'm doing like physically in practice I was doing so well like the physical aspect of my training was doing so well but mentally I was like you know what no it's fine it's fine I can do this like you know it's like one last month and then we'll be fine I can do this you know and then when I went to Tokyo Olympics it wasn't even like a normal Olympics. Like we were all stuck in the Olympic village. We had to test every day. Like we didn't have spectators. So going from London to Rio to no spectators and like, these are a lot of changes. Like you don't really realize how much it affects you until you're done with it. And like after realizing you went to two others with like a different experience, different crowd, you know, just like it is something that helps with your swimming and your racing. And then... I didn't perform well. <laughs> like I did not swim well. I did not go even to my like best time. Um, so I think that was really hard. And I think like after feeling that, you know, you like sacrifice so much and you put in a lot of work and commitment and discipline to like really perform your best. And it doesn't come. Obviously, you're upset. You as a swimmer, as a person, as a human being, you get upset because you know all of the hard work and the effort you've put into this. And it didn't come. So after that, I obviously got a lot of backlash of like my performance. I, yeah, like, I really want to talk to just, you about that. I don't think people yeah. understand the, the the degree to the extent that I actually interviewed you while you were in Tokyo about how yeah. horrible people were, not just to you, to yeah. most Egyptian athletes. It wasn't just yeah. you, but of course, with you, there is a certain level of expectation. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, what happened when you were in Tokyo? Did you, did you know that yeah. the reaction was that bad? So I, like, I, in, like, during my race, I would turn, like, the week of the Olympics, I would turn off my social media. I wouldn't even turn it on because it's the distraction for me. But, like, once I was done, I was able to see and, like, read and, like, realize, like, like, literally, it was so much backlash. And I, like, I understand I didn't do well, but, like, they've like disregarded everything else I've did I've done throughout my career like before like I felt like that performance really defined me and I think that's what made me angrier and I'm like you guys don't understand what I've done to like be at this level like I'm away from my family I'm in a different country like I'm training my best I've stayed an extra year to like be my best perform my best like obviously I am upset that I didn't get <laughs> you know, the time that I wanted or the rank that I wanted. But like, I think the amount of backlash is when I realized moving forward, I would not care as much about what others are saying about me, even if like outside of my circle, outside of my support system. And I think like, like after Tokyo going into Abu Dhabi, uh, short course world championships, and then Budapest in June, world championships long course I think that season was more of like I don't want to say redemption but it was just like I believe in myself I know this was just a mishap but this does not define me or my swimming career like I will show you guys what I'm capable of (laughs) you felt like you had something to prove even exactly um, that that kind of gave you that urge right yeah it gave me that fire of just like you know like I would just have that fire that I'm going to like train like twice as hard now just to show you guys, you know, and this is when like I went best times in both of my events after. And then people don't even know that the 50 fly are not in. It's not in the Olympics. It's not like world championship is equally as hard, by the way. It's just like same people with a different venue. 
you know? And I think, like, not having the 50 fly and then going into the 100 fly, also that takes a completely different training that I've been going through just to be my best. And, like, they just thought because I medaled in 2019, so I'm going to medal at the Olympics, and it's not the case. Like, even going into Paris, like, I need to keep reminding people that the 50 fly is not in the Olympics. It's not the Olympics. You can't put the same expectation on me. I'm training for the 100 fly. I'm training for the 50 free. But the performance in, like, obviously, I want to perform my best, but they're just not the same as the 50 fly. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so before, before your quote-unquote redemption tour, uh, <laughs> which I'll talk a little bit more about because... There's a there's a fun anecdote from Abu Dhabi that I want to tell people about. But before that, uh, did you allow yourself to wallow? Was there like a really low point before yeah. the up? Like, how did you yeah, get? For sure. How bad did it get? Did you even think of stopping? Yeah, like I think like after Tokyo and receiving all this backlash, I moved back home. This is I was like, I'm done with Virginia. I can't go back there. I need to be home with my family and have that support system. Just like you know, to recharge, like, I need to disconnect, I need to not think about swimming for the next month, like, I literally took a month and a half off from swimming, and that was, like, a big deal for me, because I don't, I've never taken a month and a half off from swimming, and I honestly feel like, in the beginning of it, it was so hard, like, I didn't want to go outside, I was scared of, like, what people might tell me, or my, how people might view me, and, like, I was not, enjoying that summer at all and I think like what really helped me is the belief in myself and my family believing in me but also like the support that I got from family and friends and like they kind of reminded me why or like how I got to where I was you know and I think like we even had to like watch a few race videos online just to like you know get that encouragement and motivation back kind of thing but, like, I would literally sometimes just cry myself to sleep. I know, like, it's funny now, but it wasn't funny then at all. Um, and then, like, going into the next season, I knew I didn't want to go to the U.S. because mentally I was just, like, I was really tired. I just needed to be home and train. And this is when I trained with Coach Chief Habib, like, I was again training alone, which is also really hard and like putting in my own system in place here at home so I can have that emotional support and like, you know, find that balance of keeping my training at how it, it was. So like creating my own system here at home. So like finding a coach, finding a weight coach, finding a masseuse, like finding a lot of things that I had in the US to have it here in Egypt to have my own system that would work going into Abu Dhabi and budapest 2022 so in abu dhabi i remember i interviewed you before the the championships because you were an ambassador so you were one of like the faces of the championships and you said i'm going pressure free i'm i'm not going to put a lot of expectations but i also haven't swum best times in a long time and i want mm -hmm. to do that and then i saw you between two of your semi-finals you had seven minutes. This is this when you was seven fascinating. Yes. I don't think people understand what it means to <laughs> compete in multiple events. And I think the schedule was brutal for you because like the 100 fly and 53, if I'm not right. mistaken, yeah. they were seven minutes apart. So I saw you run out. You have to, usually you come to, you know, you pass by the mix zone, which is where journalists yeah. are waiting for you. But yeah. I knew you had another race. I was like, I'm, I'm going to stay away, you know. <laughs> I'm going to stay away. Yeah. But I saw you <laughs> rush out of the pool. You had just locked your spot in the final of, I think, the 100, 100 fly, fly, yeah, which is huge, right? Because that's the race. First of all, I remember you said that you went to Virginia because one of the reasons you wanted to work with Sergio mm -hmm. Lopez, the coach there, is that he would help you improve your 100 fly, which yes. is the de dedication that you've already been doing this for years and you still want to go out of your way to improve something else. I think that's big. Mm -hmm. But then you make the final in the 100 fly and you have seven minutes and then you go to the, the physio. I forget his name now, but he's a lovely yeah. person. Uh, what's yeah, the name of the we, we call him Hayoui. It means the magician, kind of like the yeah. magician. Yeah, uh, that's what we call or him. talisman or something. So, yeah. so you go to him literally for seven minutes. He's like trying to help you just with any shape or form to, to yeah. you know, massage your arm or this or that. And I took a photo just because I hope I can I can include it in this. Like yeah. you're on the floor for just a few minutes and then you ran back to the pool and yeah. did the 50 free. 
mm-hmm. semi. So I, I thought that was like in, so intense, so yeah. intense. But then you, you, you achieved what you wanted. You, sw- you swam those times. And then yeah. Budapest, you, you broke the hundred, the African record in the hundredth fly, right? Twice in that. In that. Yeah. I know and, that now it's no, and not the yours anymore, fly. but we'll get to I that. know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm but the 50 we, fly too, yeah. <laughs> true, right? So 50 yeah. fly, 100 fly, you set new African records. Tell, tell me just how it felt when you, when you, after Budapest, how did that feel? 2022, it's a year after yeah. the Olympics and you've done that. How did that feel? It was, honest, it was a very proud moment. I was really proud of myself, like from being, pre- like, I don't want to say rock bottom, but like I was at such low point in my life and to be able to get up and like perform my best, I was really proud of that. And I know I've, I haven't done it alone, like. I've had support from my family and friends, like even my coach and like everyone just still believed in me to like perform and I did. So it was something like as a thank you to everyone who helped me come out of the low, you know, and I think like obviously the media now started to like give me more attention and everyone is so nice now and I'm like, you know what, it's always going to be like that when you're on top, they want to be next to you and you're <laughs> like at the bottom they don't want to talk to you so I just accepted that and just like realized like as long as I'm a good person and like I have you know um like people who love me and support me I think that's what's the most important thing at the end like you need to be happy with yourself and the rest is eventually gonna go away (laughs) one way or another so world championships this year because obviously because of the COVID thing, there were back-to-back yeah. years with World Champs. So yeah. you, you were in Japan this year. And again, mm-hmm. you, 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 you swam really well. You come fourth in your race. Yeah, How no. heartbreaking is fourth? I'm just curious, like at this point yeah. in your career, having gone through it all, you, I know that athletes try to detach themselves from, like you don't put your worth with results because if you do yeah. that, it's going to be heartbreaking the whole time. Yeah. But fourth means literally just like a whisker away from the podium. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how, how, how did you view uh, Japan, the world championship? Um, I think like overall, like I was proud of myself because again, the consistency takes so much. And I think like being able to be in the top four for the past six years, you know, so that's something I should be proud of. Obviously, I wanted to get a medal, but I think like just having a different, like taking a step back and having a perspective of like how that season was going. I think like training alone was also really hard for me because you can do it for a season, obviously. And then another season it is doable, but I think, like, with swimming, it just takes a lot out of you. And I think, like, afterwards, I realized I need to be training with my team again. You know, I miss that feeling of having a team. And I miss that, that feeling of, like, you know, racing each other in practice and having people push you and, like, cheer for you. Um, I think I've reached my maximum here in Egypt with what I have. And this is where where I wanted to be okay like Paris is coming up like we I mentally emotionally psychologically I want to be happy and enjoying swimming and I feel like I'm gonna be the happiest around the team and like a place where I really had great success and like California is obviously a really nice state like there are fun things to do and this is when I real like this is when I knew I wanted to go back to Cal and train there and be with my teammates and, you know, um, go back to something that I'm familiar with. So you're back in Cal now. I know you're, I mean, you're currently in Cairo, but you are back in Cal. Uh, Yeah. Do you just call them up and be like, hey, I want to come? And they're like, yeah, sure. Or how does it work? (laughs) (laughs) So like after Worlds, I even saw some of my teammates from Cal and I like miss them so much. And I like, it was such a nice encounter and this is when I started thinking like my god what if if I go back to Cal how fun would that be so like I reach out to the coach um so now Dave Durden who was the men's coach is now coaching both men and women so I reach out to him and like tell him 
look, I'm going to be honest with you, like training alone really sucks. And I think like mentally, I can't take it anymore. So I was wondering if it would be a possibility for me to come back to train with you guys for the like Olympic season coming up. And honestly, he was so nice. He was very welcoming. Obviously, he was telling me like, this is your second home. You can come back anytime. Like literally no, like literally he did not hesitate once, you know, just like he was very nice about it and very welcoming. And like um, one of my teammates, I, I don't know if you know her, but Abby White, so she is a U.S. Olympian and she's also there. So I figured like people who swim the same thing, like have the same mentality and mindset towards racing and competing internationally was also a very big bonus. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to come back. <laughs> That is awesome. It's like a full circle a bit. Uh, yeah, like literally, literally a yeah. full circle. <laughs> so just going back to the African record of the 100th fly, I know that Aaron Gallagher uh, has yes. broken it. Does yeah. that kind of stuff bug you? Like, do you want to make sure that to get it back somehow? Or is it, is it a motivation um, or what's it like? Yeah, it is, it is for sure motivation because like obviously I'm very competitive and I think a lot of swimmers are very competitive. So the fact that she took it by 0.01... In the hunter fly, obviously, it's like, like, it just stings me a little bit. But you know what? It's okay. I'll get it back eventually. <laughs> I'll give it to her for a few months. <laughs> I love that it matters to you, considering you, you there are so many African records. And I went and looked, and there's quite a bunch yeah. in short course and long course and everything. So yeah. uh, you'll get it back. Uh, yeah, I like, I like that. Um, so I am curious. What... Uh, what would you wish you had known when you were younger now that, you know, you're 28 now? Um, do, is there anything c you feel that, okay, with everything I've learned, I wish I had known that when I was younger? I think the one thing is, like, I was a little too harsh on myself. Like, I think some things when you're young, you're not really aware, like, you're not really aware of like how tiny this is, is this is compared to like other things I think like I learned throughout that I'm gonna ask myself is this gonna bother me in 10 years <laughs> and if it's a yes then I should probably stress about it and like worry about it and try to fix it but if it's a no I literally just let it go like, even if that's something that's making me upset or sad about a race, like, I give myself 24 hours to, like, really be sad about it, you know, let all my tears out and just, like, cry it out, let my anger out. But after 24 hours, 24 hours, I just flip the page. So I think, like, learning that sooner, obviously, when you're younger, you don't really know that. But I think if I knew that younger, maybe my journey would have been a little easier I would say <laughs> like just like I think I was very stubborn too just like no it has to go this way like otherwise I'm not gonna perform but I think like you can reach a certain goal or like a destination in so many different ways it doesn't have to be like one plus one equals two like sadly with swimming there is no formula I wish there was like literally one season I could be do something be doing something and the the next season something completely different and just like get you know different results as we go so the thing is just being maybe like less fixated with a plan and being stubborn about following it without opening my eyes to the bigger picture and like not being sad about the tiniest things <laughs> I know hindsight is twenty twenty, right? It's easy to say that now, but I I'm sure. I know. Also, I know. Yeah, <laughs> but also in a way, uh, every I I feel uh, every successful athlete I've ever spoken to, there is a common thread of every tough thing they've went through. They somehow, even if it wasn't immediate, even if it came later, yeah, it it kind of contributed to them succeeding later. But For it's sure. so difficult when you're going through it. I'm sure I, exactly. I wouldn't even know how <laughs> yeah. it is. <laughs> Um, yeah. Do you, do you, where where do you feel you're at right now in terms of your swimming? Do you feel you're at, you're back to your best, or do you feel you're even better, or do you feel the best is yet to come? Like how how are you seeing it? So right now I went back to Cal and I'm training there, and like I think that um, just like being in a different environment, I know it's familiar, but like going back to that, and I think my body just adjusting to that. I think mentally, because I'm a lot happier 
with my swimming and just like people with me on the team and having teammates and just like we're all going through the same lifestyle together I think that's definitely better than last season and I think that for sure is going to help me perform better and I think like obviously right now I'm I'm 28 I've like done my fair share of different like training and like learning what works for me what doesn't work for me I think just like as I matured in the sport I know more what works for me personally so having that experience and like wisdom <laughs> but like you know with mentally being happy around a team is definitely going in the right direction of where I want to be in Paris in terms of working with a sports psychologist, having gone through everything, is is that something you're constantly doing even when you're... Because I feel like sports psychology now, it's almost like a it helps being a preventative thing. It's, it's like even mm-hmm. when you're on a high, you still need to work on it. Is that something you do? And in what way is it helping you? Yeah, I for sure still talk to my sports psychologist. psychologist. I think it's very important to have one because like in your life in your season you're gonna go through so many things like there hasn't been one season that I haven't gone through something it could be something big something small but I think just having someone there to like guide you through it even to just like talk it out sometimes it helps like I think that is very important and especially going into Paris Olympics I think coming up with the pressure and expectations and like after what I went through Tokyo I think it's good to have someone there guide you through it. I know that in different phases in your career, probably different people have inspired you. I'm just wondering, is there anyone in particular, whether another athlete in the sport, outside the sport, not even an athlete, someone who has said something that resonated with you or someone who's who's kind of inspiring you at the moment? I honestly feel like Ons, Ons Jaber, the tennis player, has really inspired me. I think... Just having a Tunisian woman who's like Arab and Muslim and also just like representing really well, like even outside of what she's doing with tennis, like I think her as a person is really inspiring with like how she carries herself. Like, you know, just obviously I don't know her personally, but just like looking from the outside, I think she's a very good role model to have for people to see and get inspired by and to like look up to, you know, and I think she really inspires me to like keep pushing, you know, obviously we all have that competitive side of like, we always want to be our best. So I think she does a really good job at like, even with the setbacks and even with like not, you know, going through the next match, she's still, you know, getting up and like fighting back. And I think that's very inspiring. And I think sometimes I just take that into my swimming and like, fight back you know keep fighting until we get what we want i think she's gonna be very happy to to hear that because also <laughs> she really does wear her heart on her sleeve and like yeah she, she does like she doesn't shy away from like crying on the big stage and, and sharing oh, how she feels and, yeah and everyone like sobs with her <laughs> like yeah i remember like, like in the just, window... <laughs> yeah i was just gonna say you could really feel like she's very genuine it's like what you see is what you get kind of thing and i think sometimes with athletes you miss that you miss seeing that because like the more you grow, the more fame you get, the more persona you have to have, you know, to put on. But I think with her, it's just like very transparent and genuine. And I think that's very inspiring. So one of the things, obviously, she's recently done with, with what's happening in Gaza and the war and everything yeah. is that like she, she broke down on the court, right? She couldn't like, yeah. she couldn't help it just from, from how she felt about everything that was happening. And mm-hmm. I, I asked Lewis Hamilton about this just a couple like a few weeks ago at the formula yeah. one where i was telling him um how can how can he like be in formula one and racing and it's a big show mm-hmm. and there's so many like it's a, like a party right yeah While all this is happening and he's also paying attention to it how does he yeah. reconcile both things and he said it's mentally draining it's 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 it sometimes is. difficult to wake up in the morning to see all that how i'm sure that affects you too because sports yeah. is not isolated from what's happening in the world right exactly, yeah. how, has that been difficult it has been difficult, especially that I'm in the U.S. too, just surrounded by, you know, what's happening in the U.S. I think that's really hard. And I think for me, I felt alone in a bit for like the first few months because like no one really was talking about Palestine and no one was really talking about what's actually happening. Like I think in the U.S. people are like mis 
informed and like they're not really aware of what's going on like even like some of my teammates are not even like how you don't have any awareness of, of what's happening in the world and it's really hard to like sit down and have a conversation about that because they don't even get that like they don't even get that kind of information you know and I think that's really hard and this is when I like leaned on my family to like try to talk about it because I needed to talk it out like I can't just like see all of this and not get affected like I'm a human being and like what is happening is not okay and I think just like in a way just trying the hard thing about sports is just like you still need to perform you know and I think like people expect of you to perform no matter what's happening in the world and I think for me I learned how to I don't want to say cope because it's not the right word, but it's just like trying. Compartmentalize, maybe. Um, I yeah, I think yeah, I think that would be the word. It's just really hard because like it's been taking a lot out of me mentally, you know. And I just feel like as much as I'm supporting and I'm donating and I'm like doing everything on my part because like. I am supportive of Palestine and what's going on is just sometimes I need to switch off a little bit because I need to, you know, think about how, like, I don't know if I'm saying this in the right way, but just like think like that's the right word, like helpless. Like I want to help. I want to do my part, but sometimes I just feel like I don't know what else to do. And it's like really sad and hard. And especially, like, when you see all of that online, it's like, how is the world silent in a way? Or, like, how is the world not changing? It's just, like, it also creates anger, but I think I've managed to find a way to, like, not still show up to my responsibilities and my commitments and my job kind of thing. I ask this to everyone I'm interviewing on this podcast because... It- everyone places their own expectations as fans we do that right if even mm-hmm. you're cheering on a team yeah. like oh, i don't know i want liverpool to win every year mm-hmm. you know you put these random expectations yeah. without knowing what's going on inside i'm gonna know for you what would make you walk away from paris feeling okay this was a success i think just um going my best times i don't want to put like a rank or a place i think like once i just focus on my time everything else is going to work itself out so I think like going best times would make me really happy and do and knowing that I've done my best going into it yeah I like that I like that I, I, I hope you you keep remembering that and yeah when, no, when it gets noisier <laughs> and the pressure yeah I'm goes sure up. it's gonna start getting noisy soon <laughs> But uh, but no, I I wish you the best of luck. Uh, thank you so much. Thank I think you. this was really insightful, and I hope that when people hear about all this, they kind of start understanding a little bit more what an athlete yeah. goes through to be at that elite level. And yeah. uh, enjoy Cairo and thank enjoy you, Cal- Cal- Sunny California. Thank you. I'm I'm really happy that you're back there. And uh, yeah, thank we'll speak you. soon. Thanks, buddy. Yes, thank you so much. This was a truly insightful episode with Farida, who I felt was very open about the psychological roller coaster that comes with being a professional swimmer. Our conversation was a welcome reminder that we hardly ever know the full story before placing judgment on an athlete, and we are sometimes too quick to pile on the pressure, irrespective of the circumstances. We'll be taking a short break before returning with brand new episodes of Uptown. In the meantime, check out our previous episodes if you haven't already and let us know who you'd like us to speak to in upcoming conversations. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Rima Bullil and this is Uptalk.